Section eight of Autobiography of Phineas Pett by Phineas Pett. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Section eight. The Autobiography of Phineas Pett, Part four. The beginning of December, I had warning to attend at St. James upon the preparation for the funeral of our master, and had black cloth delivered to me according to the place I was ranked in above stairs which was a gentleman of the privy chamber extraordinary and the sixth day after being sunday all his highness's servants waited at st james upon his hearse then standing in the chapel to whom dr price then one of his highness's chaplains directed an excellent sermon his text being taken out of the third chapter of the second book of samuel the thirty-first verse in these words rend your clothes put on sackcloth and mourn before abner there were very few present at the sermon that did not bitterly mourn and shed tears in abundance the next day being monday the seventh of december we did attend his highness's corpse to the funeral in the abbey of westminster which was the most lamentable march that i ever went it was three of the clock in the afternoon before his body was placed under the hearse the lord of canterbury's grace preached the funeral sermon there with the body i burying all my hopes of my future preferments i came with an exceeding heavy heart that night to ratcliffe where that time i lodged after the ceremonies of the funeral were performed i returned to my house at chatham where i stayed till the twenty-seventh day of this month and then being sent for by the lord high admiral's messenger to attend his pleasure i rode to london by land where i stayed till the end of december and then returned again to my house at chatham the sixth day of january i received a letter from the lord high admiral together with the list of those ships that were appointed to be made ready for the transportation of the lady elizabeth with warrant to put them presently in hand to be graved and fitted accordingly the eleventh day i was sent for from chatham by a messenger to attend the lord admiral lying then at chelsea which accordingly i presently performed and rode to london where i stayed full three days the lord admiral sitting every of those in council attended by the principal officers of the navy the masters and master shipwrights to resolve not only for the preparation of the fleet to attend the transportation but also for preparing many vessels to be put upon long boats and barges for ships and galleys for a sea fight to be presented before whitehall against the marriage of the lady elizabeth the manner whereof concluded and ordered in writing i was licensed to go to chatham to take order for the disdain and sending up of as many long boats and sea barges as could be spared from the navy which having ordered i returned again presently to london and did there attend daily in overseeing these businesses which were put out by the great to diverse yard-keepers by reason of the shortness of the time limited for making them ready against the marriage by reason of this my continual attendance not only upon that service but also upon the admiral and sir robert mansell principally entrusted for the ordering of the whole service i first took a lodging at westminster near sir robert's house in st stephen's alley which i continued many years after amongst other vessels fitted for this piece of service was an old pinnace of the king's called the spy of the burden of sixty tons having nine pieces of brass ordnance appointed to serve as an argosy whereof i was somewhat against my will by the lord admiral's persuasion made to serve as a captain in which jesting business i ran more danger than if it had been a sea service in good earnest after the sea fight was performed i was entreated by divers gentlemen of the inns of court whereof sir francis bacon was chief to attend the bringing of a mask by water in the night from st mary overies to whitehall in some of the galleys but the tide falling out very contrary and the company attending the maskers very unruly the project could not be performed so exactly as was proposed and expected but yet they were safely landed at the privy stairs at whitehall for which my pains the gentleman gave me a fair recompense the marriage consummate and these royalties ended the lord admiral gave me a present dispatch to post to chatham to make all possible haste for to make ready the fleet 
the prince being appointed to go admiral and to transport the lady and the polesgrave's person and the lord admiral to command her so that upon the twenty first day of february i took my journey from london to chatham and about the middle of the week ensuing i caused the anne royal and the lion to be brought on the ground engraved on the twenty seventh of this month i launched the small ship i had begun to build the summer before which the lord admiral was pleased to call by the name of the phoenix and was also appointed to be one of the fleet for the transportation being commanded by sir alan apsley then victualler of the navy the fifth and sixth days of march i careened the prince and might with much ease have brought her keel above the water but that i received a strict commandment from the lord high admiral that i should not careen her but within six straits of the keel to which purpose mr thomas aylesbury then his lordship's secretary was sent down to see me perform it about the fourteenth of this month the lord admiral very careful to have all things ordered as befitted the royalty of such a service came down to chatham in person where he stayed two days to direct all things according to his liking wherein i gave his lordship much satisfaction and by the end of this month i had by my care and diligence fitted the whole fleet to set sail to gillingham the first of april being maundy thursday the prince set sail over the chain captain john king being master the lord admiral being newly come to chatham came on board of us as we were under sail and went down in her to gillingham coming to an anchor at st mary creek's mouth his lordship lay at mr leggett's on easter day being the fourth of april the lord admiral with his retinue received the holy sacrament in the parish church at chatham dr pay was the chaplain to the lord william howard baron of effingham and vice-admiral in the anne royal preached and delivered the sacrament on easter tuesday in the afternoon the lord admiral with all his retinue removed from chatham and came on board their several charges at st mary creek at gillingham and lay on board in his own cabin this night so soon as prayers were done this evening and the tables covered the lord admiral out of his noble favour to me called me unto him and there gave me special charge to take my place at his own table all the voyage and would not commonly have grace said before his lordship had seen me set down except i had been upon some earnest business giving charge also to all his officers to let me have anything of his own provisions which i should send for at any time i lay in a settle bed on one side of the master's cabin wednesday being the seventh day at quarter flood being about eleven of the clock we set sail from gillingham the wind at south-west a pretty fresh gale the ship wrought exceedingly well and was so yar of conduct as a foot of the helm did steer her we came to an anchor at queenborough a great while before high water where we rode all that night the next day being thursday the wind south-west and a very fair gale the admiral had given order we should weigh betimes to get out and accordingly the anne royal being vice-admiral in whom hugh merritt served master was fitted and prepared for the purpose having one anchor on board by the time the ship was went up upon the flood and was ready with his other anchor on peak supposing we had been so provident to have our ship in the like readiness but our master willing to do his countrymen a courtesy that lay by our side in a hoy with forty tons of beer of our provision to take in neglected the time so long being not accustomed to command such great ships that it was more than half flood before we could get our anchor on board by reason whereof the tide running very strong and the wind heartening in it was almost high water before we were fitted to set sail and our other anchor got up the wind then having power on our weather quarter and the tide upon the lee bow kept our ship from flatting and in the setting of our sails many seamen being with us that were prime commanders and captains attending the lord admiral as his retinue had every one their voice in commanding and countermanding one another that they bred a mere confusion and put the master clean besides almost his senses so that in fine the ship was put on ground at the top of high water upon the tongue of the spit of the sand going into queenborough where 
do what we could with all our wits and endeavours she sat all the tide of ebb and almost ebbed dry which unfortunate accident gave not only great discouragement to the lord admiral to have such a chance before him but also gave great advantage to the enemies of the ship of whom the lord northampton was chief to persuade the lady elizabeth not to venture her person in such a vessel that had so ill a beginning but rather to embark herself in some other and to return her home when we saw we were so fast as there was not hope of getting the ship off that tide i desired liberty to sound the place where she sat which the lord admiral easily gave his consent to i then calling into the boat with me some of the captains that were masters and mariners amongst which i chose captain robert bradshaw and captain gear for two principal with others and john reynolds then master gunner of the ship taking lead lines with us we sounded both on head stern and sides and finding soft ground and little difference in depth we were satisfied that the ship could take no hurt if she had strength sufficient to bear herself with so massy a weight as she had in her of ordnance victuals and other things in hold and her masts and sails above head with so much company both of the mariners belonging to the ship and the lord admiral's retinue being not so few in all as eight hundred persons but god be thanked the ship took no harm at all and we having sounded the depth of the same furrow she made in running on shore we caused an anchor to be laid right astern as her dock directed us and so with little difficulty she was heaved afloat into the channel in the morning tide so the great satisfaction and content of the lord admiral and general joy of the whole company for which we gave god thanks the next days being friday and saturday we lay still to prightly the ship and take in such provisions as were wanting the eleventh day being sunday we weighed and set sail and anchored for the night at the spits next day we weighed and anchored short of the long sand head next day we weighed and anchored middle of the channel next day anchored short of the north foreland the fifteenth day being thursday we came to an anchor in margate road the next day the lord admiral went on shore to margate where he lay three days at the house of mr roger morris one of the four masters of his majesty's navy and then returned on board the twenty-first day being wednesday the lady elizabeth's grace and the polesgrave with all their train came to margate there were embarked in barges and the ship's boats and were received on board the admiral where they lay all the night the twenty-second day the wind being got easterly and likely to be foul weather her highness with the polesgrave and most part of her train were again carried on shore to margate and there landed the twenty-fifth day being sunday they were all again embarked in the barges and boats and received on board the ships presently we set sail and that night anchored without the foreland the twenty-sixth day the wind shortened upon us so that we were constrained to anchor in the midst of the channel in twenty-five fathom being a windy rainy foul night the twenty-seventh day being tuesday was a very wet forenoon but about eleven of the clock whilst her highness was at the sermon it cleared up and the wind veered southerly so that we weighed both having fair weather and a fair wind standing our course quarter winds a little before we made the land we lost a man through his own wilfulness this evening we anchored under blankenberg sconce being very fair weather the twenty-eighth day we weighed about noon and anchored thwart of sluice where came on board us with his yachts the prince of orange grave morris with a great train of gallantry and followers who all lay this night on board the admiral the twenty-ninth day we weighed upon the flood and turned up to flushing some miles short of the town her highness with the palatine and most part of her train were embarked in the barges and boats being very fair weather and was saluted with all the ordnance of the whole fleet and landed at flushing where they were received with all royalty and saluted with all the ordnance of the town and castles and guarded with the soldiers and garrison of the town our ships anchored a little above the ramekins this afternoon i went on shore to attend the lord admiral and lay in flushing 
our charges being defrayed by the town the thirtieth day being friday the count palatine took leave of her highness and went post to the palatinate this afternoon i with others of the lord admiral's retinue took coach to middleburg and were lodged and billeted for our diet at the english house with him this forenoon being may-day divers of our retinue took a coach and rose to campire to see the island this afternoon her highness and her train were received to middleburg with all royalty the second day being sunday the burghers feasted her highness at the town house this evening the lord admiral brought me to take leave of her highness and to kiss her hand the next day her highness took leave of the lord admiral and his train having attended her to the place where she was embarked which done the lord admiral returned from middleburg in his barge on board the prince where he found such a multitude of people men women and children that came from all places in holland to see the ship that we could scarce have room to go up and down till very night which confluence of people lasted from the time we anchored at flushing till we weighed thence fourth day the lord admiral gave order we should weigh from flushing to avoid the trouble of people which accordingly was done and we fell down to cassant point where we anchored all that day and next night the sixth day in the morning we weighed with the wind at east north east a fresh gale and very fair weather and this evening we anchored under the gun-fleet the seventh day the wind continuing easterly we weighed and set sail and by twelve of the clock we came to anchor at gillingham from whence i attended the lord admiral in his barge to chatham where he lay that night at mr leggett's house i found my wife and family all in health and gave god thanks for his preservation of us in our journey and safe return home to our mutual comforts sir robert mansell lay at my house on saturday morning being the eighth day the lord admiral went from chatham on whom i attended to gravesend and there taking leave returned back to my house at chatham at whitsuntide sir robert mansell was committed to the marshalsea upon some displeasure his majesty took against him by the instigation of the lord northampton where he was detained prisoner till the thirteenth june following he was released at greenwich in the latter end of july i received commandment to take the charge of new building the defiance being then in dry dock at woolwich old mr baker having the charge of new building the marona at the same time in the same dock with her upon which business i was entered the second august about the middle of august old mr baker sickened and perceiving his sickened was to death was desirous to recommend the finishing of the marona to me and to that end importuned me to ride to windsor to the lord admiral to signify his earnest suit to his lordship in that behalf which was willingly condescended unto and i had his lordship's warrant at the same time for it he deceasing the last day of this month and his funeral was solemnized at deptford the second of september where myself was present about the midst of september my good faithful friend mr sebastian vickers the carver departed this life and the twenty-seventh day of this month my second son henry departed this life at chatham and at the very instant my noble worthy friend sir thomas button then captain button alighted at my house newly being returned from the dangerous voyage of the north-west passage where he had wintered the sixteenth of october i escaped a great danger by the fall of my horse within one mile of dartford being riding to chatham the twenty eighth of october i was taken very sick going by water from woolwich to westminster to accompany the ordinary shipwrights and other of chatham to move the lord admiral about their pay being much behind hand i was forced this night to lie at the king's head in fish street whither i came from westminster on foot to have prevented my sickness the whole company having appointed to dine there most part of them waked with me all that night the next day accompanied with my brother peter i took oars to gravesend and from thence rode home being taken with a fit upon gad's hill with much ado recovering my own house presently taking my chamber and being dangerously sick 
from whence I did not stir downstairs till Christmas holidays after, which happened ill for my business at Woolwich, where my absence, through the careless neglect of the foremen, the workmen made wonderful spoil and havoc. The next week after I took my sickness and the news thereof, brought to London, came to the ears of the Lord Admiral, who acquainted his majesty therewith, whereupon I received two several letters from the Lord Admiral by post, and special commandment from his majesty to be certified the truth, and to let me know that, if I needed, some of his own physicians should be sent unto me, which exceeding great grace from his majesty, and expression of love from the Lord Admiral, was no small comfort unto me in my extremity. The end of this month my wife's cook-maid died in the house, and was buried on New Year's Day. The 7th of January I returned from Chatham to Woolwich with my wife and some of my children and family, and because my lodgings at the dock were not fitted, I lay in the town at the house of a widow-woman called Mistress Spick for the space of a month, till the lodgings in the King's Yard were prepared and made ready. The 14th of February I began to victual all the shipwrights and workmen employed upon the Marona and Defiance at Woolwich. The 28th of March it pleased God miraculously to preserve me from loss of life by a fall on board the Honour, which was only from deck to deck, by God's merciful providence very hardly escaping, to fall into the hold, which would have beat me all to pieces. The 14th of June my honourable and implacable enemy, the Earl of Northampton, departed this life at his house at Charing Cross. The 22nd of July, the King of Denmark came suddenly to Somerset House, unexpected. The 1st of August, my gracious master, King James, accompanied with the King of Denmark, Prince of Wales, Lord Admiral, and many other lords, came to Woolwich and went on board the Marona, then being in dry dock and almost finished, which ship liked them wondrous well. Here our king took leave of his majesty of Denmark, and returned to Whitehall. From hence the king of Denmark took barge to Gravesend, being accompanied with the prince and lord admiral. Sir Robert Mansell and myself were commanded to attend them. The 2nd of August the king of Denmark was entertained on board the prince, riding at her moorings in the river of Chatham, the prince of Wales and the lord admiral of England, accompanying him, sir robert mansell and myself attending the ship was completely rigged and all her sails at the yards and richly adorned with ensigns and pendants all of silk which gave very great content to the king of denmark yet it was a very foul rainy day from thence they returned to gravesend where they took leave and the king of denmark embarked in his own ships in the end of november all the workmen that wrought upon the Murona were discharged from Woolwich. The 6th of March, the Marona and Defiance were both launched out of the dry dock at Woolwich in one tide, and the 25th day of April following, they set sail from Woolwich, and the next day came to their moorings at Chatham. In May, the dock at Woolwich was prepared for the receiving in of the Elizabeth Jonas and the Triumph, who were appointed to be new-built, which ships were accordingly brought from Chatham and were both brought into the dock the first and second days of june and the gates shut again and the ships shored the twenty fifth of july the lord's grace of canterbury lay at rochester and went on board the prince riding at her moorings where he was entertained with a banquet of sweetmeats by sir robert mansell myself attending there the twenty ninth of august i removed from woolwich to chatham with my wife and family and the next day after my wife sickened of a surfeit eating too many grapes which had like to have cost her her life the ninth of october my wife was delivered of her seventh child being a son between the hours of ten and eleven o'clock at night the twenty-second day after he was baptized at chatham church and called by my own name phineas the witnesses were mr robert yardley and mr king godfathers and my sister simonson the godmother about the twenty-seventh day of March I bargained with Sir Walter Raleigh for to build him a ship of five hundred tons, which I procured leave for from the Lord Admiral, to build her in the galley dock in His Majesty's yard at Woolwich, towards which I presently received five hundred pounds to begin withal, 
and the eighth day of april following i began to set men on work upon her the eighth day of april i brought a piece of ground of one christopher collier lying in a place called the brook at chatham for which i paid him thirty five pounds ready monies the eighteenth day of april i was elected and sworn master of the corporation of shipwrights at our common hall and meeting-place at redriff the thirteenth day of may i bought the rest of the land at the brook of john griffin and robert griffin brothers and a lease of their sister belonging to the college of rochester the twenty second of may i removed my wife and some of my family from chatham to woolwich in july sir henry mannering caused me to build a small pinnace of forty tons for the lord zouch being then lord warden of the cinque ports which pinnace was launched the second of august and presently rigged and fitted all at my charge and the sixth day we set sail with her from woolwich accompanied with sir walter raleigh and his sons sir henry mannering mr christopher hayman cousin william hawkridge myself son and divers others the first tide we anchored at gravesend next night at the north foreland next tide in the downs where we landed and rode to dover castle in the lord warden's coach sent purposely for us leaving the pinnace to be brought in to dover pier with the pilot and mariners we stayed at dover till the sixteenth of august and then took leave of the lord warden and came to woolwich the seventeenth day at night towards the whole of the hull of the pinnace and all her rigging and furniture i received only one hundred pounds from the lord zouch the rest sir henry mannering cunningly received in my behalf without my knowledge which i could never get from him but by piecemeal so that by the bargain i was loser one hundred pounds at least the third day of december following died my brother cooper at chatham the sixteenth of december i launched the great ship of sir walter raleigh's called the destiny and had much ado to get her into the water but i delivered her to him on float in good order and fashion by which business i lost seven hundred pounds and could never get any recompense at all for it sir walter raleigh going to sea and leaving me unsatisfied this year of sixteen seventeen proved a very fatal and troublesome year unto me the fourteenth day of march i removed my wife and family from woolwich to my house at chatham she being so big with child that i was forced to carry her by coach and that very leisurely for that she was with child with two twins the twentieth of this month my wife's own father died at his house at highwood hill the fifteenth day of april my wife was safely delivered of two daughters at twelve of the clock at night they were both baptized at chatham church the twenty-second day in the afternoon being tuesday the eldest named mary the other martha about the midst of may i was sent for by the lord treasurer then earl of suffolk and sir fulke greville then chancellor of the exchequer and by them employed in a most troublesome business into the new forest in hampshire where one sir giles mompesson had made a vast waste in the spoil of his majesty's timber to redress which i was employed thither to make choice out of the number of trees he had felled of all such timber as was useful for shipping in which business i spent a great deal of time and brought myself into a great deal of trouble the sixth of november my daughter mary the eldest of the twins departed this life at chatham and was buried two days after at chatham the eighth day of december my young son phineas departed this life after he had lived two years two months and odd days and he was buried at chatham my dear loving wife sickened at chatham the twenty ninth day of december and hardly escaped with life yet it pleased god she did recover the last of this month my brother simonson made himself away in the garret of his own house at ratcliffe to the utter undoing of his poor wife and children in the month of june there was a commission granted by his majesty to certain commissioners for the reformation of the abuses in his majesty's navy the names of which commissioners were sir lionel cranfield sir thomas smith sir richard weston sir francis gofton sir richard sutton mr john coke mr pitt of the exchequer sir john osborne sir john wolstenholme mr borrell and captain thomas norris 
the sixth day of july these commissioners came to chatham in great state having called to assist them diverse masters of the trinity house and diverse shipwrights of the river of thames where commanding also the masters and master shipwrights of his majesty's navy they went on board the prince and there publicly caused their commission to be read the officers of the navy being present which done they proceeded to give order for the general survey of all the ships in the navy with all their furniture and all other things belonging unto them in the which was spent a great deal of time for they returned not to london till the sixteenth day of the month after myself was commanded in particular from his majesty to give them the best assistance i could which accordingly i did with all diligence and carefulness which proved afterwards to the ruin and undoing of me and all mine the whole bent of mr burrell tending only to overthrow me and root my name out of the earth by his means procuring most part of the commissioners to join with him in his malicious practice so that from the time that he was settled i was sequestered from meddling with any business and all employments and privileges taken from me captain norris being brought over me and i forced to live as a slave under them the whole of the time of their commission undergoing many disgraces and contempts which i could not possibly have undergone had not the lord been exceedingly merciful unto me in giving me patience to submit myself to his will and pleasure the whole year of eighteen nineteen and part of twenty i attended altogether at chatham being employed upon the making of the new dock and other businesses under the command of the commissioners the reward of my extraordinary pains was recompensed with no other reward than base usage and continual counsels and plats to ruin me wherein they obtained the sum of their desires to the utter undoing of me and mine mr burrell and norris my greatest enemies the twenty fourth of january in this present year my wife was delivered of a young son at chatham who was the third day of the next month being sunday baptized in chatham church by mr pyham his name called phineas the witnesses were my wife's sister russell and niece hawkridge godmothers my nephews peter and william pett godfathers the nineteenth day of this present month of july in the year sixteen nineteen the great duke of buckingham lately made the lord admiral of england came to visit the navy then riding at chatham being accompanied with divers lords and sir robert mansell who in his being here used me with such extraordinary public respect that wrought me much prejudice in the opinion of the commissioners who ever after plotted to ruin me and to bring me out of favour both with the lord admiral and the king himself the twentieth day of november attending at theobald's to deliver his majesty a petition his majesty in his princely care of me by the means of the honourable lord high admiral had before my coming bestowed on me for supply of my present relief the making of a knight baronet which i afterwards passed under the broad seal of england for one francis radcliffe of northumberland a great recusant for which i was to have seven hundred pounds but by reason that sir arnold herbert that brought him to me played not fair with me i lost some fifty pounds of my bargain about this time the commissioners of the navy had finished two new ships built by mr burrell at deptford in his majesty's dockyard and had procured the king's majesty to come thither and see them and named the one the happy entrance and the other the reformation the fourteenth day of may in the year sixteen twenty my wife was delivered of her eleventh child being the last she had being a son born at my house in chatham the twenty-fifth day after it was baptized and called christopher sir christopher cleve and his brother-in-law mr samuel haywood being godfathers and my good neighbour mistress legget godmother the twelfth day of june this present year mr robert mansell being ordained lord general of the fleet for the expedition against the pirates of algiers by his great importunity with his majesty i was commanded to go in hand with building two new pinnaces for that voyage whereof the one was to be of burden one hundred and twenty tons and the other eighty tons for which i did contract with certain merchants of the city that were appointed committees for that business whereof sir thomas smith 
mr burrell and divers others of my great enemies were of the quorum but i upon some hopes of thanks and reward enlarged them to a greater proportion than my contract making the one wherein i was myself to serve as captain in the voyage of three hundred tons called the mercury and the other called the spy of two hundred tons wherein captain edward giles served and for that i exceeded the contract the unconscionable merchants and committees cast upon me all the whole surplusage of the charge to the value of seven hundred pounds notwithstanding i was forced to hasten the business and to keep extraordinary numbers of workmen at great rates and in a place where the provision and materials were nightly stolen and embezzled to my utter undoing whereof i never could obtain any recompense though to my great expense and charge i made means both to his majesty and the lords of the council and had warrant against the committees but was continually overborne by their greatness and malice the sixteenth and eighteenth days of october both the pinnaces were launched at ratcliffe where they were built and all expedition was used to rig and make them ready to set sail i preparing myself to my great charge to proceed in the voyage and to get the ships to erith because of ice in the river where we rode till we were cleared thence by the committees which was about the twenty second of december at what time mr punyet the pilot came on board me to carry me into the downs and sir john fern that went passenger with me to the fleet my wife also came then on board of me the twenty seventh day of december we weighed and turned down from erith into tilbury hope where we rode till the twenty ninth day and then weighed and anchored in the buoy of the o's edge the thirtieth day of december i parted with my wife and sent her to gravesend in a light horseman that came to the ship with some provisions we set sail from the buoy of the red sand the first of january being new year's day and anchored in the gore where we rode one day and thence into the downs where we landed our pilot we rode in the downs till the thirteenth day and then set sail and were put into the needles and anchored at the cows two days then set sail and the fourth of february we made the south cape the eighth day we entered into the straits of gibraltar and the eighth day at night came to an anchor in malaga road the nineteenth day of september sixteen twenty one we arrived in the downs and the twentieth day at night i came safe to my house at chatham finding my wife and children all in good health for which mercy of god i gave god thanks as did also my whole family all the year sixteen twenty two i did nothing but follow the court with petitions to my infinite charge and trouble and all to little purpose for i could never prevail against my adversaries who detained all my entertainment for the algiers voyage both for myself son and servants which cost me three hundred pounds setting out and the expense of the voyage i must not forget that in the beginning of the year sixteen twenty one before i was two months out of england through the malice of mr burrell and some of the rest of the commissioners for the navy that there were diverse master shipwrights of the river of thames and some masters of the trinity house sent down to chatham to survey the state of the prince amongst which commissioners was beside old burrell and his son my fellow stevens graves dearsley bourne thomas brunning of woodbridge and one chandler a creature of mr burrell's and divers other mariners who maliciously certified the ship to be merely unserviceable and not fit to be continued and what charge soever should be bestowed upon her would be lost which they certified under their hands but the twenty fourth of february succeeding by special command from his majesty who well understood their malicious proceedings the self-same surveyors were again sent to chatham and under their hands certified that the ship might be made serviceable for a voyage into spain with the charge of three hundred pounds to be bestowed upon her hull and the perfecting her masks which certificate was returned under their hands and delivered to his majesty whereupon present warrant was granted to have the ship docked and fitted for a spanish voyage which was accordingly done and brought into the dock the eighth of march sixteen twenty three at chatham and was launched the twenty-fourth day of the same month 
about the seventeenth of this month of february i attended at theobald's the very morning that the prince's highness and the lord duke of buckingham took leave of the king to take their journey for spain being carried so privately that few knew of their intent at their taking horse i kissed both their hands and they only gave me an item that i should shortly come to see in the prince after the prince and the rest of the fleet were all fitted and prepared to set sail from their moorings the st george fell down to gillingham with the antelope being both appointed to go before to santander with the jewels and other provisions the noble gentleman my honoured friend sir francis steward commanding her whom my eldest son john pett attended as one of his retinue in that journey and captain thomas love commanded in the antelope the second of may being on a friday the prince removed from her moorings to st mary creek where she anchored thither came down from london many of the commissioners of the navy with sir thomas smith and the lord brooke who all plotted together to have hindered me from going the voyage which the king had commanded me unto but their malicious practices were prevented and their purposes frustrated the seventeenth day of may i took leave of his majesty in the park at greenwich and kissed his hand with many expressions of his favour which was not very pleasing to sir john coke then there present the twentieth of may the prince set sail from st mary creek and anchored at queenborough the twenty-first day we set sail from queenborough and anchored at whittaker twenty-third day anchored at the gunfleet twenty-fourth day anchored short of the north foreland twenty-fifth day we came and anchored in the downs where we rode till the twenty-eighth day of june having three several times proffered to go on but were still put room again but the twenty-eighth day being saturday we weighed and got as high as fairlight where we anchored all the flood and so plied to windward all the ebbs being fair weather on tuesday after being the first of july we came to anchor in stokes bay by portsmouth the twentieth day of august his majesty then lying in the new forest at bewley house embarked himself and train and came on board the prince then riding in stokes bay accompanied with marquis hamilton the lord chamberlain holderness kelly carlisle montgomery and divers other attendants who all dined on board the prince our admiral the earl of rutland being absent at london his majesty was very well pleased and after dinner again embarking in the barge lay hovering in the midst of the fleet till all the ships had discharged their great ordnance and then returned on shore at coldshot castle in the interim of our stay at stokes bay i procured leave of the admiral to go to london and the second day of august being saturday i met my wife at lambeth with my son richard there we lay that night and the next day took oars to kingston where we lay till tuesday following on which day i went to hampton court to take leave of my honoured lord and good master the earl of nottingham who then lay there in his old lodgings which was the last time i ever saw him being the fifth of august the next day i took leave of my wife and friends at kingston she returned home and myself to portsmouth on board the prince again the twenty-fourth day of august being sunday and bartholomew's day we set sail out of stokes bay in the afternoon the twenty-fifth day the wind taking us short put us into the grass at weymouth where we rode till the twenty-sixth at night and thence setting sail with the wind easterly on the twenty-eighth day being thursday we came to anchor in plymouth sound the second day of september being tuesday in the morning betimes we set out of Plymouth Sound, and by contrary winds we beat it up till the ninth day following, being Tuesday, we made the Cape of Ortegal, bearing south-west of us. The tenth day we lay becalmed, and the eleventh day, about two of the clock in the forenoon, we came to an anchor in the river of Santander. The twelfth day, it pleased God, the prince and all his train came to Santander, and presently took his barge, being there ready attending for him and came on board the prince accompanied with all the spaniards that attended him thither where we all joyfully received him after some stay on board his highness resolving to lie at santander town that night where provision was made to entertain him and his train he took his barge to go back 
whereinto we being overjoyed with his safe arrival forgot to send either master pilot or mariner to conduct him to the town being a dangerous rocky way and the tide of ebb bent which runneth there with a very swift stream which had likely to have proved a very dangerous accident for that in an instant of embarking there arose a very great tempest of rain and wind and darkness withal so that the barge could not possibly row ahead the tide whereby she was in great danger to have been driven to sea out of the harbour's mouth to the utter loss of all in her had not god in mercy prevented it by the vigilant care of the captain and officers of the defiance sir sackville trevor being the commander who seeing the danger they were in veered out casks and boys with lights fastened unto them by small warps of which they taking hold were rowed and hailed on board the ship where the prince with all his train were entertained and lodged all this night the weather proving so stormy and rainy that no provision from any other ship could be brought unto them the thirteenth day being saturday the prince came on board his own ship and lodged in his own cabin the fourteenth day being sunday the prince feasted all the spaniards that accompanied him to the waterside the cardinal zapata and his brother who was a grandee being the chief with gondomar and divers others of the king of spain's servants whom he feasted with no other provisions than such as we brought out of england with us stalled oxen fatted sheep venison and all kinds of fowls and other varieties in abundance wanting no ordnance to welcome them withal loudly speaking every health but it was a very foul rainy day notwithstanding at their going from the ship all the ordnance was discharged in our ship all the rest of the fleet following in order as they passed by to the town of santander the rainbow wherein sir henry palmer commanded as captain and john king one of the four masters being master by neglect of following the admiral could not get within the river's mouth but was forced to leeward where she rode three days and nights in such extremity as every hour it was expected when she should drive upon the shore which she hardly escaped by god's great mercy and upon the tuesday after came safely off and anchored under the prince's stern on thursday being the eighteenth of september we set sail out of santander river the wind somewhat southerly from whence we beat it to and fro with contrary winds till the twenty-sixth day after being friday at which time a little before noon we had sight of Scilly, which bore north-east of us about some eight leagues off this day we met four dunkirk men of war very well fitted chased by holland men of war whom the prince caused to come to leeward and their commanders to come on board whom his highness laboured to have accepted a peaceable course which the hollanders durst not accept whereupon they were dismissed the dunkirkers having liberty to have the start of the hollanders which many disliked saturday all day we plied to and fro and got within some four leagues of the islands the wind at north-east but fair weather on sunday a council of war was summoned wherein was principally propounded his highness landing upon the island of Scilly in the ketch some pilots of the island being come off unto us but it was generally protested against under all the council's hands and so were dismissed to the charges but after supper beyond expectation order was given to make ready the long-boat and to call the ketch and the prince made choice of all the company should accompany him on shore and so about one of the clock after midnight with great danger to his highness's person and to the lord duke of buckingham they were put into our long-boat which was veered astern by a long warp where the ketch laying the long-boat on board and the sea going somewhat high they entered the ketch disorderly without regard to any but every one shifting for themselves being all shipped the ketch was so overburdened that she could make but little way so that after we had taken farewell with the discharge of a volley of our great ordnance we tacked into the sea and left the ketch to ply into the island which she safely gained by seven of the morning and had landed the prince and all his company on st mary's island the next morning our admiral advised with me what course we should take with ourselves for the prince had commanded sir henry mannering who was captain under the admiral and sir walter whiting the master of the ship 
to attend him in the ketch, I being left purposely to supply both their places in their absence. After serious consultation with the master's mates and two pilots of the island, who all assured us we might safely go in, the admiral resolved on that course, and after two or three boards we laid it in quarter winds, and came to an anchor in the best of the road about two of the clock afternoon. The prince and all his train standing upon the lower point of land, and welcomed us in as we passed close by with much expression of joy, and heaving up of their hats. The prince and his train lay in the castle four nights. On Friday morning, being the 3rd of October, we set sail out of Scilly, and on Sunday following, being the fifth day, we came into St. Helens, and anchored on no man's land and shipped the prince and his train into our long-boat and other ships boats who were safely landed at portsmouth about eleven of the clock we taking our farewell with discharge of all our great ordnance seconded by all the fleet with general thanksgiving to god for our safe arrival to the joy and comfort of all true-hearted subjects End of section eight. Section nine of Autobiography of Phineas Pett by Phineas Pett. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Section nine. The Autobiography of Phineas Pett. Part five. The twenty fourth of May, sixteen twenty four, being sent for to St. James's, I there received from Sir Robert Carr, by the Prince's Highness's order, a gold chain of the value of one hundred and four pounds in way of reward for my attendance in the voyage into spain in bringing his highness home which chain i was commanded to wear one day and to wait upon the prince to the parliament which i accordingly did and received very gracious respect from his highness about this time i was joined commissioner with captain love captain edward giles and mr john reynolds the master gunner of england to take up diverse colliers and to put them out to sundry shipwrights to be fitted for men of war for which service i never received allowance in the beginning of october this present year happened a wonderful great storm through which many ships perished especially in the downs amongst which was riding there the antelope of his majesty being bound for ireland under the command of sir thomas button my son john being then passenger in her a merchant ship being put from her anchors came foul of her and put her also from all her anchors by means whereof she drove upon the brakes where she beat off her rudder and much of the run abaft miraculously escaping utter loss of all for that the merchant ship that came foul of her called the dolphin hard by her utterly perished both ship and all the company yet it pleased god to save her and got off into the downs having cut all her masts by the board and with much labour was kept from foundering my son john was sent post from the ship to sir thomas button who was presently sent by the lord admiral on board and brought warrant for me to attend him to the ship to use the best means we could to save her after our coming on board by placing chain pumps into the steward's room we kept the water easily under and then fitted a rudder and jury mast by which means she was safely brought to deptford dock and her defects perfected about the end of december this present year the prince was docked to be prepared and fitted to sea meanwhile the duke of brunswick came to chatham accompanied with divers of the prince's servants and went on board the ship in the dock the twenty ninth day of january after the prince was launched and soon after had her mast set and divers other ships graved and made ready for a voyage to sea the twenty eighth of march sixteen twenty five certain news was brought to chatham of king james's death and the next day after his majesty was proclaimed amongst us in the navy at the hill house the masters boatswains gunners pursers and all belonging to the navy were present all april and may i attended at chatham to prepare the fleet and was then bound to fetch over the queen in the latter end of may his majesty came to rochester where i presented myself unto him in the dean's yard and kissed his hand and had speech with him till he came into the house where he dined and i attended him all the dinner while thence i hasted home and waited his majesty's coming by towards canterbury 
who alighted at my house and stayed there a while and gave me leave to drink his health and then returned to his coach giving me charge to follow him and to hasten on board the prince being then in the downs according to his command i presently took horse and followed him and lay at sandwich that night and next day came into the downs went on board to the vanguard commanded by captain pennington bound for france where i met sir thomas button captain ned giles and other good company there dined and after was set on board the prince saturday the fourth of june his majesty came on board the prince riding then in dover road where he dined and was safely landed again yet this evening we let slip and went room for the downs with very foul weather thursday the ninth of june we got over to boulogne and anchored in boulogne road the tenth day we had a great storm the wind north-west where all our ships drove and we break our best bower and were forced to let fall our sheet anchor which put us both to great danger and puzzle of loss of men and boats and had also one of our men belonging to the steward room drowned sunday morning being the twelfth day all things prepared fit and the great storm allayed about eleven of the clock we received our young queen on board and having a fair leading gale fitting the entertainment of a queen we set sail out of boulogne road about one of the clock and before eight had safely landed her and her train at dover monday morning i left the ship and went on shore at dover and missing my horses was forced to go to sandwich where i lay all night and next day hired post horse home the boatswain of the ship john hancroft died so soon as i was landed upon the beach the fourteenth day of july sixteen twenty five my eldest son john pett was married to catherine yardley youngest daughter to mr robert yardley of chatham deceased the wedding was kept at our own house the twenty fourth of september my wife's mother sickened at my house at chatham and the fourth of october she died and the sixth day being thursday she was buried in the chancel of our parish church mr pyam made her funeral sermon the last part of this christmas quarter i was posted to and again from chatham to london and hampton court about building of small ships and presenting plats of them both to the king and commissioners of the navy to very little purpose and my great trouble and charge my son joseph died in ireland in february this year in the year twenty six i was called to sundry employments the one to have built a new ship at chatham of three hundred tons and mr burrell was to have built another for which i made moulds and sent them into the woods by one thomas williams shipwright who hewed the frame in the woods which was brought into the yard with an excellent provision of long straight timber but by the malice of mr burrell the business was hindered and not suffered to go forward so that the frame was kept in the yard till it was good for no use of shipping but afterwards i was employed to bring two small pinnaces of seventy tons apiece or thereabouts which i performed accordingly at chatham my son richard being my principal foreman they were called the one the henrietta the other maria after the queen's name also the commissioners of the navy growing to be called in question for their actions in the latter end of this year there was a great commission of lords and divers other experienced captains granted under the broad seal for inquiry of their actions amongst which number i was chosen one much doing was about it but in the end it trenched so far upon some great personages that it was let fall and nothing to any purpose done in it but divers of the commissioners came to chatham and surveyed the state of the ships and other things and so in the end of the january following we turned all to london the fourteenth of february being wednesday and st valentine's day my dear wife anne departed this life in the morning and was buried the friday after in chatham church in the evening leaving behind her a disconsolate husband and sad family not long after i being at london my only sister then living mary cooper departed this life the fifth of march for very grief of the loss of my dear wife this summer my son john was made captain of a merchant ship and served under sir sackwell trevor's command in the taking of the french prize called the saint esprit in july i was contracted to my second wife mistress susan yardley the widow of mr robert yardley whose daughter my son john had formerly married 
the sixteenth of the same month we were married at st margaret's church by mr franklin mr george wilson gave her in the church the twentieth of february sixteen twenty seven the commissioners of the navy were summoned before the lords and their commission called in and dissolved and the government of the navy conferred upon the principal officers then being to be carried as in former times the twenty sixth of february attending the officers of the navy at sir sackville crowe's house by charing cross sir john pennington came thither to acquaint them with a warrant from the lord duke directed to him and myself for present bargaining with the yard-keepers of the river for the building of ten small vessels for the enterprise of rochelle of some one hundred and twenty tons apiece with one deck and quarter only to row as well as sail the twenty-eighth day of the same month we concluded our bargains with the several yard-keepers and drew covenants between us and delivered them impressed accordingly in this business i was employed till the latter end of july that the ships set sail to portsmouth my son john was placed captain in the sixth whelp built by my kinsman peter pett having liberty from the lord duke to make choice for him amongst them all i chose that pinnace before the rest supposing she would have proved best which fell out afterward clean contrary the twenty first of this month of july as i was going to london to attend the meeting of the officers of the navy i was arrested at the suit of one freeman upon three executions for timber delivered to the building of sir walter raleigh's ship and the two pinnaces built at ratcliffe for the expedition of algier and was forcibly carried to prison to the counter in the poultry where i was lodged all night the next morning the king and the lord duke being made acquainted by sir john pennington with the business the lords of the council were twice assembled about my clearing and the care recommended to the lord treasurer weston who employed his secretary mr john gibbons to see me freed which was done by a habeas corpus to remove me to the fleet where i was carried and there put in bond for my appearance the first day of michaelmas term so for that time discharged mr gibbons defraying the whole charge a little before this his majesty gave me a blank for making a baronet which was signed by his hand i received warrant from the lord duke to go to portsmouth there to attend the setting out of the fleet which accordingly i did taking my journey from lambeth the first of august accompanied with my son richard william dalton and some other shipwrights when i came to portsmouth by means of some friends i procured a convenient lodging in a private house where i lay all the time of my being there in which i saw many passages and the great disaster happening unto the lord duke after the mutiny upon the green on friday in the evening about where i lay all the time of my being there about the execution of a poor seaman that was hanged upon a gibbet on the beach and the next day being saturday and the twenty-third day about ten of the clock the duke was murdered in captain mason's house by a private discontented lieutenant called felton being stabbed with a knife to the heart as he was talking with sir thomas blank at the parlour door the fourth of september my son john took leave of me in the evening and went on board his ship whom i never saw after being unfortunately cast away in the return from rochelle both ship and men perishing in the sea as it was supposed foundered in the storm which was a grievous affliction to myself my wife and his own wife left great with child at his going to sea the sixth of september the service concluded and all the fleet sent away i left portsmouth accompanied with my son richard and returned for chatham coming thither on monday the eighth day finding my wife and family in good health praising god for our comfortable meeting after divers passages and journeys from chatham to london and hampton court to my great expense and could conclude nothing for clearing my arrest i was forced for saving harmless my sureties in the fleet to deliver myself a prisoner the first day of the term going thither in the evening taking possession of the chamber provided for me with a heavy heart my son richard accompanying me afterward being advised by my worthy friend captain pennington who never forsook me in all my troubles but furnished my wants continually way was made to acquaint his majesty with my case who very graciously gave order to the lord treasurer to see me freed from prison where i continued notwithstanding six or seven days before i could be released and an agreement concluded with freeman for his debt by the lord treasurer 
which done i presented myself to his majesty who used me very graciously in this interim i received certain intelligence of the great loss of my son john his ship and all his company who foundered in the sea about the seams in the great storm about the beginning of november not one man saved to bring the doleful news no ship near them to deliver the certainty but a small pink belonging to the fleet that was within ken of her and saw her shoot nine pieces of ordnance hoping of succour this affliction was the greater for that his dear wife was much about the time of her husband's loss delivered of a son at my house at chatham having a mournful time of lying in which son was baptized at chatham church on sunday the twenty-third day afternoon called phineas the witness my wife godmother myself and good friend mr george wilson being godfathers towards the end of december i was appointed by the officers of the navy to take charge of docking the vanguard at woolwich which i presently took order in to have the dock fitted and prepared for that purpose i docked the vanguard and caused the dam to be made without the gates then took down the gates and wharves within the dam and made all new both floor wharves and gates which was finished in a short time about this time riding from woolwich to greenwich sent for by captain pennington midway betwixt both the horse gave me a dangerous fall close by a ditch side full of water by which i received a great hurt upon my right leg and thigh which was sore bruised by the fall insomuch as i had much ado to get back again and was not recovered of the hurt in six weeks time but was forced to use crutches about the beginning of june by captain pennington's procurement i passed the baronet given me formerly by the king for which the captain received for me two hundred pounds which he sent me to woolwich in gold about this time i gave over my house at chatham and surrendered the lease thereof to mr isaacson the painter who renewed it for longer time with sir robert jackson then lord of the manor towards the end of september i was employed by the lord treasurer weston as a commissioner for his majesty to the forests of shotover and stowood near oxford which forests were granted from his majesty by letters patent to the earl of lindsay wherein i discharged my beauty so effectually as gained me a good opinion both from his majesty and the lord treasurer from which employment i returned to woolwich the eighth day of november having finished a tedious and troublesome business the twenty seventh day of november it pleased god to take from me my dear beloved son richard who died with me at woolwich and was buried in the church chancel next day after being a great affliction unto me by reason he was my eldest son then living being a very hopeful young man and for his years an excellent artist being trained by me to that purpose for making of ships a little after christmas i was employed as a commissioner with mr treswell surveyor of his majesty's woods to view certain parks of his majesty as Ditton park sunning park and folly john park lying near about windsor which we dispatched in four or five days and returned back to westminster and delivered in the account and certificate of the business to the lord treasurer towards the middle of february there was a resolution by his majesty and the lords of the admiralty to make an addition of assistance to the principal officers of his majesty's navy for the better managing of that great business by experienced men to which purpose mr william burrell was nominated as one and myself by his majesty's own appointment was chosen for the other not without some strong opposition which could not prevail so that there was a letter under his majesty's signet directed to the officers and ourselves to sit with the officers and to authorize us to proceed together in all businesses concerning his majesty's service which was twice read in public court at their meeting in mincing lane the eighth day of march sixteen twenty nine and then we took place first with them where it was concluded to begin first with a general survey of the whole navy at chatham and all stores within and without doors and to put out by the great as we should hold fitting the repair of all apparent defects in the ships which was recommended wholly to the care of mr burrell and myself which was effectually performed by us and the works of the ships put to mr goddard one of the master shipwrights to be done by contract which business we fully concluded by the end of march sixteen thirty after we had settled all business at chatham deptford and woolwich mr burrell and myself took our journey the sixth of may to portsmouth 
where we arrived the eighth day after taking up our lodgings at the dock with the clerk of the stores where mr burrell lay and myself at the clerk of the check both mr brooks and brothers here we stayed upon dispatch of all business concerning the defects of the ships surveys and other material business which having all ordered settled and graved the ships we returned thence and came to london the fourth day of june following the fourth of august there was a great commission sent to portsmouth to take a view of the harbour and the river running up to fareham for the removing of his majesty's ships to a more safe place of riding all the principal officers of his majesty's navy being commissioners together with mr burrell his majesty's masters of the navy and six of the chief masters of the trinity house there was much dispute and contrariety about the business but in the end a fair agreement was concluded some of the masters of the trinity house there sickened which hastened both their returns and ours back in the return home myself was taken very sick at farnham where mr burrell and myself parted he staying behind about some particular business of his own but we never saw one another after being the thirteenth day of august it pleased god that i got home to woolwich that very night very dangerously sick and stirred not out of my chamber in eight weeks space in which interim mr burrell died in an inn as he travelled toward huntingdon the end of this present month about the twenty-third day of november following i was sent again to portsmouth with a commission to search and inquire about the worm which was reported to eat the ships in the road to their endangering and hazard there were diverse master shipwrights joined with me in the business but upon strict examination upon oath there could be no such matter found but only a rumour raised to hinder the keeping of any his majesty's ships in that harbour about the end of december his majesty signed my letters patent for the place of a principal officer and commissioner of his navy and the nineteenth day of january following i had my letters patent publicly read at the meeting of the principal officers of his majesty's navy in mincing lane in london and accordingly took my place amongst them the twenty-sixth day after they were publicly read before the whole navy men at chatham the twenty-third of february i brought my wife from woolwich to chatham in a coach all the way by land we alighted at san yardley's door where we took up our lodging the first of march i received from mr robert smith messenger of the navy eight commissions of purveyance and other business concerning the navy under the broad seal of england directed to me the twenty-first day of april being thursday his majesty accompanied with divers of the lords as the treasurer chamberlain marquis hamilton holland and others came to woolwich to see the vanguard launched that day which was performed to his majesty's great content i entertained them in my lodgings with wine cakes and other things which were well accepted his majesty commanded me into the barge with him purposing to have landed at deptford to have seen the st dennis newly repaired in dry dock but the rain hindered his landing and i was taken out of his majesty's barge into a pair of oars on friday morning was launched the victory lying above the vanguard in the same dock at woolwich on friday being the thirteenth of may i shipped all my goods and household stuff from woolwich in one starland's hoy which were all safely landed at his majesty's new dock at chatham the next day on monday the sixteenth day i brought myself and family into my lodgings at the new dock wednesday being the fifteenth day of june all the ships in the navy at chatham being completely trimmed in all points rigged and all their sails at yards and ordnance on board his majesty attended with divers lords came to strood about two o'clock afternoon where the officers of the navy attended his highness with barges and boats and being embarked rue down the river on board the prince and from her on board all the ships riding in that place at his majesty's embarking the ships did orderly discharge their ordnance the king went to his lodging at the crown rochester next morning betimes his majesty took his barge again and went on board the rest of the ships riding in the upper reach beginning with the lion being the uppermost ship so to the rest in order observing the course and order of the discharging their ordnance as the day before then landed at the old dock and viewed all the ordnance upon the wharves then walked on foot to the new dock 
by the way taking notice of the rope-house and storehouses without the dock gates then came into the yard and viewed the stores and houses after came into my lodgings where he stayed a pretty while then went to the top of the hill on the back side where his majesty stood to see the ordnance fired from the ships from thence walked back to the old dock where his highness took his barge to rochester all the way hovering to observe the trained band placed in two battalions and skirmished in warlike manner to his majesty's great content his majesty landed at rochester and went to dinner then called for the officers of the navy giving them many thanks for their care and pains then took his coach to gravesend thence up by water to greenwich monday morning being the twenty fifth of july i took my journey from chatham towards portsmouth riding through sussex we came to portsmouth the twenty seventh day at night and lodged at the queen's head we were sent to provide and prepare all the ships riding at portsmouth in manner as they were at chatham to entertain his majesty resolved to view them all which was accordingly performed the second of august being tuesday his majesty came to portsmouth accompanied with divers lords and presently took boat and went on board each several ship from thence treatably returning and the ships saluting him with their ordnance his majesty was landed by six of the clock and went directly to the governor's house where he was lodged and called for supper as soon as he came next day i attended his majesty for order for removing the ships which presently was done by his majesty's own mouth and waiting at dinner his majesty commanded me to attend the lord treasurer and others to transport them into the isle of wight and bring them back which i carefully performed in his majesty's pinnace the maria appointed for that purpose and safely landed him from the cows at titchfield haven being attended with one of the whelps i returned to chatham from portsmouth the tenth of august after the twenty fifth of this month being thursday my son john's wife lost in the sixth whelp was married to edward stevens a shipwright in chatham church the wedding being at my house in the new dockyard where we gave entertainment to all his friends till monday after when they returned for london in the beginning of this year sixteen thirty two i was commanded from his majesty to assist my son peter in the building of a new ship at woolwich which was begun in february being of the burthen of eight hundred tons and tonnage most part of the frame and provisions being made in the forests of shotover and stowood oxfordshire my son had the oversight of the work about the eighth of june his majesty came to woolwich to see the work where i entertained him afterwards in my lodgings and attended his majesty to deptford in his own barge where we landed to view the other new ship built by mr goddard the thirtieth day of january sixteen thirty three the new ship at woolwich was launched the king's majesty being there present standing in my lodgings it proved a fair day and a good tide so that the ship was put out without strain of tackle which much contented his majesty who soon after took his barge and returned to whitehall the ship was named the charles after his own name the next day the new ship at deptford built by mr goddard was launched the king and queen's majesties being present and was called after the queen's name henrietta maria by the beginning of march the henrietta being come to ride at woolwich by the charles both being ready fitted to set sail for chatham his majesty was pleased to come down in his barge on board the charles we presently weighed with both ships and set sail with the wind at south-west and better his majesty went in her a little beneath barking creek and then took his barge and returned we taking leave after the manner of the sea with our voices and whistles and the king's trumpets upon the poop by low water we were got beneath the nore a good distance and there anchored all night and the next flood we turned up as high as oakham ness and there anchored and on monday after came over the chain the twenty second of march i was appointed to make a journey to portsmouth to take survey of all the business there both on float and on the shore mr edisbury mr goddard mr goodwin the master mr apslin and our clerks going along with us we took our journey from london on friday morning and came to portsmouth on sunday afternoon it was the sixth of april following before i returned to home to chatham the eleventh day some peter first time
took his journey to Woodbridge in Suffolk to see Mrs. Cole's eldest daughter. The 15th of June, 1633, I went a journey to Portsmouth from Chatham through part of East Kent, accompanied with Sir Henry Palmer, Captain William Hawkridge, newly returned from captivity, our clerks and servants. Saturday and Sunday night we lay at Buckwell, at Captain Moyle's, whose wife was sister to the Lady Palmer. Monday we rode to Sir William Campion's, where we were very kindly entertained till Wednesday morning. Thence taking leave, we rode to Lewis to dinner, thence to Shoreham, where we lodged that night, thence to Chichester, there dined, then to Portsmouth, where we stayed four days to dispatch business there. Which done, we came thence to Guildford, and so London, and the twenty-sixth day, being Wednesday, I came home to Chatham. The 5th of July, 1633, being a Friday, I began a journey from Chatham by sea into Suffolk, in the little Henrietta Pinnace, commanded by Captain Cook, one of the master attendants of His Majesty's Navy, accompanied with young Mr. Henry Palmer, Mr. Isaacson, son Yardley, cousin Joseph, my sons Peter and Christopher, man Charles Bowles, and George Parker. We set sail from Gillingham in the morning, having a fair gale at south-west. We anchored against Harwich between two and three of the clock afternoon, and from thence shipped ourselves and company in boats for Ipswich, arriving there afore six in the evening, and lodged at the Angel Inn, which was then kept by my cousin Barwick. On Saturday morning we were horsed to Woodbridge on Hackneys, whither we came about eleven of the clock, and were lodged at the Crown. After dinner we went to visit Mrs. Cole and her daughters, with whom we had a large discourse about the match of her daughter with my son Peter, and found our propositions entertained, I having great liking to the maid. Sunday we and our train dined and supped at Mrs. Cole's. Monday we invited mother and daughters, and Mr. Fleming, to dine with us at our inn, whither came to us diverse of our friends, to whom we gave the best entertainment the place could afford. In the afternoon we had private conferences together, and concluded the match, and contracted the parties with free consent on both sides. We supped this night at Mrs. Cole's. Tuesday forenoon, having dispatched all our business, we took our journey by horse to Landguard Point, accompanied with Mistress Cole, her daughters, and other their friends and neighbours, whom we entertained a while on board our pinnace, and there resolved the day of marriage. Thence we accompanied them on shore saw them horsed, and so took leave. My son and some other of our company accompanied them to Woodbridge, being overtaken with a mighty storm of rain, thunder, and lightning all the way. All the next day proving very foul and wet weather, the wind contrary, and my son and his company not returned, who came not to us till almost three in the afternoon, we concluded to stay till next morning in the road. Myself and most of our company went on shore to Harwich, and there lay the night. Thursday morning we came on board betimes and set sail, and that tide came up as high as Bishop Ness, in our river of Medway, where we anchored and had boats meet us from Chatham, in whom we embarked, and were safely landed at the dock about seven Friday morning, 12th of July, giving God thanks for our prosperous voyage and safe return. About the middle of this month, my son Peter had ordered to prepare moulds for a frame of a new ship of five hundred tons, to be built by him at Woolwich, and was assigned to have the timber out of Stowood and Shotover in Oxfordshire. About this time also, Sir Henry Palmer and myself were deeply questioned about making sale of brown paper stuff, which we claimed as a perquisite to our places, and by the information of Mr. Eddisbury, our fellow officer, to Sir John Coke. The information was presented with a great deal of malice, and His Majesty was made acquainted with all. But it pleased God that their malice took no effect, the King giving us a free discharge, only we repaid the monies received for the commodity to the Treasurer of the Navy for His Majesty's use. The third day of September my son Peter came to Chatham accompanied with Mr. Sheldon and Mr. Francis Terringham, and the next morning we embarked ourselves at the new dock, accompanied also with Mr. Bostock, cousin Joseph, and son Christopher, and all our provisions, and came on board the Henrietta Pinnace at Gillingham, where Captain Cook attended us ready to set sail. From whence with a prosperous gale, the wind at south-west and a very fair weather, we came to anchor before Harwich about six of the clock. 
all our company went on shore to harwich where we lodged that night and the next day from thence took our journey to woodbridge where we were joyfully received and entertained by mistress cole and her friends on sunday following being the eighth day of september my son was married to mistress cole's daughter in woodbridge church after the sermon on the thursday after all my company took leave at woodbridge and came to our ship riding at harwich where we lodged that night and on friday morning embarked ourselves and set sail having the wind fair we got up as high as oakham where we anchored and took boats to st mary creek where we landed and walked home on foot giving god thanks for our prosperous voyage and safe return the eighth of december being sunday lying at my lodging in mincing lane london as i was going to church in the forenoon i was set upon by six sergeants who arrested me at the suit of my sister pet widow to my brother peter by whom i was used uncivilly but after they were told by sir henry palmer they would be called to account for abusing the king's servant they let me go which turned me afterward to a great trouble and a suit in law to my great charge in the month of february were launched to the unicorn at woolwich built by mr boat and the next spring following was launched to the james out of deptford dock built there by my nephew peter pett the king's majesty being in person present at both places where i attended his highness all the time of that business the twenty-second day of the same month sir henry palmer and myself were commanded to attend the lord's commissioners of the admiralty to answer the great information prosecuted against us by the malice of secretary coke by intimation of mr edisbury newly made surveyor of the navy for selling the old brown paper stuff as perquisites of our places we were not called in till the evening none but mr fleming and myself appeared sir henry palmer purposely absenting himself there were present at the council table earl dorset sir henry vane secretary coke and secretary windybank mr secretary coke delivered his majesty's pleasure with despiteful aggravation of the fact and the dangerous precedent to others the conclusion was that his majesty's command was we should be suspended our places we were not suffered to make any reply but dismissed and referred to his majesty's further pleasure on the monday after i attended to speak to his majesty so soon as he was ready in his withdrawing chamber where his majesty was pleased to call me to him and before all the lords there present and my professed enemy secretary coke his majesty used me very graciously with large expression and protestation of the continuance of his future favour and continued encouragements which though secretary coke liked not yet he made great show of his well-wishing to me in his majesty's presence but notwithstanding all this i repaid the monies i had received for my share being eighty six pounds to the treasurer of the navy for his majesty's use out of my yearly entertainment about the middle of march my son brought his wife and his mother with their family from woodbridge to my house at chatham where they all stayed with us till the twenty third of april following and then went all to woolwich where my son was employed upon the building of his majesty's ship the leopard the twenty second of june was finished a little ship being completely rigged and gilded and placed upon a carriage with wheels resembling the sea was enclosed in a great case of deals and shipped for london in the fortune pink and was out of her taken into a wherry and carried through a bridge to scotland yard and from thence to st james's where it was placed in the long gallery and presented to the prince who entertained it with a great deal of joy being purposely made for him to disport himself withal the twenty sixth of june his majesty came to woolwich in his barge to see the frame of the leopard then half built and being in the ship's hold his highness calling me aside privately acquainted me with his princely resolution for the building of a great new ship which he would have me to undertake using these words to me you have made many requests to me and now i will make it my request to you to build this ship commanding me to attend his coming to wanstead where he would further confer with me about it the twenty ninth of october the model made for the great new ship was carried to hampton court and there placed in the privy gallery where after his majesty had seen and thoroughly perused he commanded us to carry it back to whitehall and place it in the privy gallery till his majesty's coming thither which was accordingly performed in march sixteen thirty five the eleventh day 
his majesty came to woolwich to see the launching of the new ship built there by my son peter the which ship i caused to have her mast set in the dock and to be completely rigged and ten pieces of ordnance placed in her with her sails at the yard the ship being launched betimes she was by his majesty's command called the leopard by sir robert mansell after the ship was clear out of the dock his majesty came on board and there stayed almost one hour we hoped to sail her whilst his majesty had been on board but the wind came northerly that we could do no good to lead it to our moorings at his majesty's parting away in his barge we gave nine pieces of ordnance in the midst of april his majesty was graciously pleased to renew my privy seal for my pension of forty pounds per annum payable in the exchequer with order for all my arrears due upon it the eighth of may following my son peter received the same arrears being one hundred pounds the fourteenth of may i took leave of his majesty at greenwich with his command to hasten my journey into the north to provide and prepare the frame and timber and plank and tree nails for the great new ship to be built at woolwich and having dispatched all warrants and letters concerning that business and some impress of money for travelling charges i took leave at woolwich and came to chatham leaving my son to see all the moulds and other necessaries to be shipped in a castle ship taken up for that purpose to transport all our provisions and workmen to newcastle and to send the ships to take us in at queenborough the twenty first of may my son with his wife mother and sisters and rest of the company being come to us at chatham and in readiness we accompanied with cousin joseph's wife and mine own company we took leave at chatham in the morning and repaired by our boats to queenborough where the ship was in readiness where we embarked ourselves intending to have set sail presently but the wind chopping to east and northeast we could not stir that tide but rode till the morning then weighed and set sail and got down as low as the blacktail sand where we anchored all the flood at high water being about three o'clock in the afternoon we weighed again and plied down beneath the spits and there anchored all that night saturday morning we weighed and set sail again and the next day by five afternoon we came to an anchor against harwich and landed all our passengers bound for woodbridge who got thither that night and the next myself and the rest of my company went for woodbridge where we stayed till tuesday afternoon and then returned to harwich to our ship wednesday forenoon we set sail from harwich and thursday morning we came into yarmouth road where we anchored went on shore and dined and after dinner returned on board and set sail plying our course till saturday morning being got within twenty leagues of newcastle the wind took us short and we put room and were landed not without some danger at scarborough where we lay that night and our ship put room for bridlington sunday morning we got horse with some difficulty and rode to whitby where we were kindly entertained and lodged at one captain fox's house then lying sick there we found much kindness at the hands of one mr bagwell a shipwright and yard-keeper this was the thirty first of may monday morning we parted thence and came to gisborough a great market town where we baited from thence we went to stockton where we found but mean entertainment being lodged in the mayor's house being a poor thatched cottage on tuesday we came to durham where we baited from thence we came to newcastle about five of the clock lodging this night at the post-house where we were very homely used but the next day we moved thence to mr leonard carr's house where we were very well accommodated and neatly lodged in which house we lay all the time of our abode at newcastle this was the third of june sixteen thirty five after our coming to newcastle and that lodged ourselves conveniently we advised together how to proceed in our business that no time might be lost and first viewed the places from whence we were to make choice of our frame and other provisions which were chopwell woods and brancepeth park a good way from one another then having marked such trees as were fittest our purpose our workmen were disposed of to their several charges and began to fell square and saw with all the expedition we could that work being settled my son carefully followed that business whilst i myself attended the lord bishop of durham with my commission and instructions whom i found wonderfully ready and willing to give all furtherance to us assisted by other knights and gentlemen 
justices of the peace in the county who with all care and diligence took order with the country for present carriage god so blessed us in our proceedings that in a short time as much of the frame was made ready as laded away a great collier belonging to woodbridge which was safely landed at woolwich and as fast as provisions could be made ready they were shipped away that from chopwell woods was laded from newcastle that which came from branspeth from sunderland having ordered all our business both for carriage monies and all other needful things to set forward the business leaving my loving son peter to oversee all i took my leave of my friends at newcastle the twenty-second day of july being wednesday and came to durham where we lodged that night at the post-house next morning i waited upon my lord of durham with whom i dined and after dinner took leave and returned to my lodging friday morning being the twenty-fourth day i parted from durham accompanied with my son christopher charles bowles and the guide we met also bound our way towards london three scottish gentlemen and their attendants who very kindly accepted of our company and we rode together to northallerton where we lodged that night at the postmaster's next day we rode to york and lodged at the postmaster's sunday we stayed at york all the day myself being entertained at dinner by sir arthur ingram and at night by alderman sir william allison monday morning twenty seventh day we rode to dinner at wentbridge thence to doncaster to bed tuesday we rode to tuxford where we dined thence to newark upon trent there lodged this night wednesday morning we rode from newark to grantham where we dined thence to stamford where lodged this night thursday being the thirtieth day we rode from stamford to huntingdon and there dined and met my old acquaintance and noble friend sir oliver cromwell after dinner we took horse again and at huntingdon town's end the scottish gentlemen and we parted they took their way for london myself and company for cambridge where i lodged at the falcon and visited emmanuel college where i had been a scholar in my youth friday being the last of july after i had visited trinity college and some others i rode from cambridge to bury in suffolk where we only baited and rode that night to stowmarket coming thither very wet having rained very hard all that afternoon there we lay that night from thence rode next morning to ipswich drank only at the greyhound inn and thence came to woodbridge alighting at sister cole's about eleven of the clock being the first of august i stayed at woodbridge till tuesday the fourth of august thence taking leave i rode to witham to bed from thence next morning taking horse i came to gravesend ferry there passing over my horses i stayed there coming and then taking horse again i came home to my house about four o'clock afternoon in safety and health giving god thanks for our safe meeting after eleven weeks absence from thence the fourth of november being tuesday it pleased god to send my son peter safely to woolwich where we met together to our great comfort and so gave order for proceeding in our business the twenty-first day of december the keel of the great new ship was laid in his place upon the blocks in the dock most part of the frame and other provisions came safely to woolwich and were landed in the yard the sixteenth day of january his majesty accompanied with divers of the lords came to woolwich to see part of the frame and floor of the ship at that time his majesty gave order to myself and son to build two small pinnaces out of the wastes of the ship the twenty eighth day of march his majesty came again to woolwich accompanied with the polesgrave his brother duke robert and divers other lords who all stood in the windows of my lodgings to see the two pinnaces launched which was performed to their great content and named the greyhound and roebuck about the tenth of april his majesty's ship called by the name of the anne royal bound for to be the admiral of the narrow seas and anchoring in tilbury hope being unmoored the ship winding up upon the flood came foul of her own anchor which pulled out a great part of her keel above the mast and so in sinking overthrew so suddenly that some of the company were drowned amongst whom was the master's wife and one other woman myself amongst others was commanded by his majesty to give any assistance for weighing of her which cost much trouble great charge and no small danger to them that travelled about it which was afterwards objected to them as a great fault and were rewarded with a bitter check from the lords 
the ship was weighed and carried to blackwall and put into east india dock about tenth of august the third of february his majesty came to woolwich by water accompanied with the prince elector and divers other lords where he thoroughly viewed all the works of the ship without and then went on board and seriously perused all the ship within board both aloft and in the hold being very well satisfied in all points and then retired himself into my lodgings where he stayed till flood and then took his barge and returned to whitehall tuesday the twenty fifth of april my daughter martha was married unto john hodian sometimes my servant she was married at chatham church accompanied with the best sort of our neighbours who were entertained in the garden under a long tent set up for that purpose where they ate dined and supped on the twenty-first day of july being friday i brought my wife from woolwich to chatham in a coach having been very ill some weeks before we brought her safe to my house and the next day she was to our thinking very cheerful and was visited by divers our good neighbours but on sunday she grew very ill and continued worse and worse all that night about three o'clock monday morning she fell into a sweet sleep and so like a lamb quietly departed this life and the wednesday afternoon following was buried in chatham church accompanied with the better sort of all the neighbours about us mr vaughan our minister preached at her funeral End of section nine. Section 10 of Autobiography of Phineas Pett by Phineas Pett. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Autobiography of Phineas Pett, Part 6. Tuesday, being the 29th August, proved a very wet, rainy day, but the shipwrights of the river, which were warned to help to strike the ship upon the ways, being come together, we set on the business and by god's blessing the ship was struck by eleven of the clock without harm to any man which we accounted a great mercy of god monday the twenty fifth of september was the day peremptorily appointed by his majesty for launching the great ship and accordingly all things were prepared in readiness for performance thereof his majesty accompanied with the queen and all the train of lords and ladies their attendants came to woolwich for the most part by water landing at the dock stairs about twelve of the clock and went directly on board the ship where they stayed about one hour and thence retired into our rooms prepared and furnished for their entertainment about two of the clock the tackles were set taut and the ship started as they heaved till the tackles failed and the water pinched being a very poor tide so that we gave over to strain the tackles and began to shore the ship then his majesty with the queen took their barge and returned to whitehall being very sorry the ship could not be launched we attempted two or three tides afterward to no purpose it was then concluded to let the ship sit till the next spring sitting so easily and safely that she could take no hurt after it was resolved the ship should lie till the spring after which was about the twelfth or thirteenth october following in the interim many malicious reports were raised to disable the ship and to bring as much disgrace upon me as malice itself could possibly invent all proceeding from the masters of the trinity house and other rough-hewn seamen with whom william cook one of the four masters of his majesty's navy enviously adhering to pleasure secretary coke and mr edisbury then newly made surveyor of his majesty's navy all professed enemies to the building of the ship and more to myself joined together to cast what aspersions upon both as far as they durst for fear of the king's displeasure but the time of the spring drawing on there was a meeting called by sir robert mansell's means at woolwich of such trinity house masters as were formerly employed on the business with the officers of the navy to resolve of the certain day and time of launching which was generally concluded to be on sunday following being the fourteenth of october and that i should not attempt to stir the ship before but on the saturday night tide the wind chopping up for westerly and a fair night in hand promising a great tide to follow i caused the two masters of the navy there attending to be ready commanding all we could on the sudden get-together 
to attend us contrary to the mind of mr cook who was very unwilling to meddle with the ship in the night though mr austin the more resolute man was very willing to take the benefit of the first opportunity to launch the tide came in so fast that the ship was on float by three-quarters flood which i perceiving thought it fit to command the ship to be heaved off the night being fair and calm which accordingly was presently performed and the ship brought into the channel and from thence by several warps conveyed safely to her moorings by high water keeping lights with reed all alongst the shore till the mooring cables were taken in and made fast to the bits which success with much thankfulness we acknowledged an especial mercy of god towards us this done i presently dispatched a messenger to sir robert mansell at greenwich who came with all speed on board us and according to his majesty's commandment gave the name to the ship and named her the sovereign of the seas the next morning the company of the trinity house masters and others appointed to attend the launching came according to the appointment to give their attendance but finding the ship already launched and at her moorings in the midst of the river they seemed to be much discontented that they were so disappointed and prevented which they expressed as far as they durst this morning sir robert mansell rode away post to the king lying then at hampton court and acquainted his majesty with our proceedings who was wonderfully pleased with it the week following we reared the shears to set the masts which was performed with much safety and expedition and all the masts set within fourteen days and so soon as the rigging could be in some reasonable complete manner fitted and sails brought to the yards the ship was removed from woolwich to erith by reason there was a greater depth of water to ride in his majesty had been on board of her before she went thence on the twelfth of may sixteen thirty eight the sovereign set sail from erith to greenhithe where she anchored to take in her ordnance and provisions the sixth of june after his majesty accompanied with the queen duchess of chevreuse duke and duchess of lennox with divers other lords and ladies more came on board the ship at greenhithe where they dined to their great content at their going from the ship we gave them seventeen pieces of ordnance the tenth of february before i received particular warrants from his majesty at council table being himself there present for bringing the ship from chatham to woolwich dock which was by my care speedily performed and the ship safely dry docked the twenty-first day of march following about the twelfth of july the sovereign weighed from greenhithe and anchored a little beneath gravesend where she rode till the king's majesty came on board her which was upon the twenty-first day of july being saturday coming down in his barge and rode some part of the way against the tide in the time of his being on board his majesty observed the condition of the ship as she now rode ready to sail that is the draught of water the distance of the ports of the lower tier from the water number of the ordnance and all other circumstances to her complete furnishing wherewith he was so well satisfied and pleased that he parted from her with as much expression of content and satisfaction as we could expect from him to the general comfort of us all before his majesty took barge i had placed my then wife byland daughter anne and many other gentlewomen my special friends in the great cabin to kiss his majesty's hand and prevailed with his majesty to walk aft into the cabin where his highness most graciously gave each of them his hand to kiss his majesty then took his barge and at his going from the ship we gave him seventy-two pieces of great ordnance i then with my wife and friends went on shore and took the coach and came directly home thursday the second of august i took leave of my wife and friends at chatham after supper so rode to gravesend thence on board the sovereign and lay on board in mine cabin being the first night i lodged in her friday my son peter came on board from woolwich then about ten of the clock we weighed from gravesend and stood down beneath whole haven and there anchored that night being little wind saturday morning the fourth of august we weighed from whole haven and stood down beneath the buoy of the gumfleet where we anchored all that night sunday we came to an anchor right before margate town where we rode till thursday morning following 
then weighed and set sail with the wind at west but coming about the foreland we met the wind so far southerly as put us to go without the sand and blew so much wind as we could bear our topsails but half mast high so that we could not possibly weather the south sand head the tides running all so dead we were forced to anchor in thirty-two fathom and there rode that night which proved reasonable fair friday morning the twentieth of august we weighed having the benefit of a whole tide of ebb we weathered the south sand head and stood in right thwart of dover but neither the town nor castle took notice of us so we put room into the downs and anchored as near sir john pennington then riding admiral as we conveniently could do being about eight of the clock in the morning we were saluted by the admiral and all the ships in the road whom we answered again giving the admiral twenty-one pieces this done we went on board the admiral sir john pennington to whom we were continual guests while we stayed in the downs wednesday morning being the fifteenth of august we set sail out of the downs the wind at south and sometimes south-west we turned to and fro with very foul weather till we came as high as thwart of shoreham or thereabouts the garland attending us who was not able to keep way with us which course we held till saturday the eighteenth day of august then finding in that time we had sufficient trial of the condition and working of the ship in all respects and having but a small proportion of victuals to stay out longer we resolved to bear up again for the downs which accordingly was done and about three o'clock afternoon we anchored close to the admiral sir john pennington entertaining us on board his ship all the time we rode by him tuesday morning the twenty first of august i took leave of the sovereign and the admiral and went on shore at deal where i found my man attending ready with my horses being the night before come hither where i presently took horse and rode directly to canterbury having visited sir henry palmer by the way i baited some hour or more at canterbury and took horse again and came home to my house at new dock a little after four in the afternoon giving god hearty thanks for my safe return finding my wife family and friends in a reasonable health the twenty eighth of august the sovereign came home to her moorings at st mary creek being tuesday the eighth of september my dear wife sickened taken with a violent fever being then great with child the nineteenth of september being wednesday between eight and nine o'clock in the morning she departed this life in a most christian manner surrendering up her spirit into his hands that gave it her the next day after being thursday she was buried in a seemly manner in chatham church close by the side of my first wife leaving me a sorrowful and disconsolate husband within few days after deceased also my wife's one sister and next neighbour wife to mr john short clerk of the check to his majesty's navy they sickened together she also being with child and knew not of one and t'other's death soon after died mr etherington their own father at mr short's house who came thither purposely to visit them after i had a little passed over this great and sudden affliction i prepared myself to go for london and having set all things in order on thursday morning the twenty seventh of september sixteen thirty eight i took leave of my family at chatham and rode to gravesend thence took boat to woolwich where i stayed one night and next day accompanied with my son peter we went by water to kingston where we took up our lodging in a private house the inns being full the next day being sunday we went by water to hampton court where we presented ourselves to his majesty who was pleased to use us very graciously where we spent that whole day at night returning by water to our lodging at kingston next morning my son and myself rode to sion to wait upon the lord admiral and was presently commanded by him to hasten to chatham to prepare barges and boats to be sent to dover for the receiving on shore the queen mother expected to arrive and land there here the manuscript ends end of section ten Section 11 of Autobiography of Phineas Pett by Phineas Pett. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain.
Grant to Phineas Pett, twenty sixth of April, sixteen o four. In Latin. Patent roll, sixteen forty six. The king to all to whom etc. Greeting. Whereas our dearest sister Elizabeth, late deceased Queen of England, by her letters patent under the great seal of England, bearing date at Westminster the twenty third day of January, in the twenty sixth year of her reign, gave and granted for herself her heirs and successors unto matthew baker and john addy shipwrights and to the longer liver of either of them among other things a certain annuity or annual rent of twelve pence sterling a day to have and to receive yearly the said annuity or annual rent of twelve pence sterling a day to the aforesaid matthew baker and john addy and their assigns and to the longer liver of either of them from the feast of the nativity of the lord then last passed before the date of the same letters patent during the natural life of the same matthew baker and john addy and the longer liver of either of them from her treasury and that of her heirs and successors at the receipt of the exchequer at westminster of herself her heirs and successors at the hands of the treasurer and chamberlain of her her heirs and successors there for the time in being at the four terms of the year namely the feast of the annunciation of the blessed virgin mary of st john the baptist of st michael the archangel and of the nativity of the lord in equal portions and whereas also our same dearest sister elizabeth by other letters patent under the great seal of england bearing date at westminster the twenty-ninth day of july in the thirty-second year of her reign gave and granted for herself her heirs and successors to joseph pett shipwright another annuity or annual fee of twelve pence a day of lawful money of england to have hold and receive unto the same joseph pett and his assigns during the natural life of the same joseph pett from the treasury of her her heirs and successors at the receipt of the exchequer at westminster by the hands of the treasurer and chamberlain there and from time to time existing as by the several said letters patent more plainly doth appear which said matthew baker and john addy and joseph pett to this day remain alive and to this present have and enjoy the said several annuities by virtue of the several letters patent aforesaid know ye that we of our special grace and sure knowledge and mere motion also in consideration of the good true and faithful service to us done and hereafter to be done by our beloved and faithful subject phineas pett now serving our dearest son henry prince of wales both in the building of the ships of us our heirs and successors and in his attendance on our marine affairs and causes have given and granted and by these presents for ourself our heirs and successors do give and grant to the same phineas pett that annuity or annual fee of twelve pence sterling a day of good and lawful money of england out of the two above named annuities whichever first after the date of these presents by death resignation surrender or composition of any one of the aforesaid matthew baker and john addy and joseph pett or in any other manner shall have become vacant or determined or shall hereafter become vacant or cease to have hold enjoy and receive the said annuity or annual fee of twelve pence a day as is in manner aforesaid vacated or determined or shall hereafter determine to the aforesaid phineas pett or his assigns for the term of the natural life of the same phineas immediately from the time at which either of those annuities shall first become vacant or determine as aforesaid from the treasury of us our heirs and successors at the receipt of our exchequer at westminster by the hands of the treasurers and chamberlains of us our heirs and successors from there time to time in being at the four terms of the year namely at the feast of st michael the archangel the nativity of the lord the annunciation of the blessed virgin mary and the nativity of st john the baptist in equal portions to the aforesaid phineas pett or his assigns during the natural life of the same phineas pett annually to be paid the first payment thereupon commencing at that feast of the aforesaid feasts which first and nearest shall fall after one of the two separate aforesaid annuities of twelve pence a day 
shall become vacant or determined in the mode and fashion above specified although express mention etc in witness etc witness the king at westminster the twenty sixth day of april by writ of the privy seal end of section eleven